That's the wide bodies touring cars. And then we have the um, all singing, all dancing scale saloon, which in my book is the, uh, the only one-tenth electric touring car available, which has been designed, manufactured, and sold as a basic tarmac racer in touring car fashion. And with the success of the British Touring Car Championship, um, this championship is taking off very, very big indeed. Uh, as we can see here at Ashby, we've had uh, a very damp start to uh, blistering sunny conditions. Uh, the grip element is up, and uh, we've got over 135 drivers here today in all three classes. We start our coverage with the Formula One A final. In pole position is Ian Whittingham. Ian gets a good start and dives into the first corner. But Terry Atkinson is soon on his tail. Past the driver's platform for the first time, and already these two cars are pulling away from the path. Oh, Whittingham clips the chicane, and this is the battle for third place. Whittingham making his way through the back markers and still leading in the final stages of the Formula 1A final. Atkinson in second is losing power and slips down to third place, just letting Darren Lewis through to take second. Here are the finishing positions. In the Touring Car A final, Matthew Hall starts in pole position, and as they enter the first corner, every driver is fighting for the racing line. They're all bunched up as they scream past the driver's stand for the first time. Car four, Robert Slater, and car seven, David Hall, neck and neck as they enter turn one. But Slater takes the inside, leaving Hall in trouble. Just look at this battle for second, third, fourth, and fifth. This is the final, so there's everything to race for. Screaming past the driver's stand, no room for error. Mike Leavesley and John Robeson bumper to bumper fighting for second place. Through the chicane, keeping the racing line. Past the drivers again with only 15 seconds left, and Robson pushes Mike Leavesley to make a mistake. This is the battle for second place. Mike Leavesley holding off John Robson, and Robson hits Leavesley and pushes past. Matthew Hall takes first place, John Robson second, and Mike Leavesley third. Here are the final results. Model car racing is dominated by male drivers, but there are one or two female racers. I get a lot of attention, yeah. People don't like it when I beat them now and again. Some of the blokes can't take it, you know. Some nice drivers do, but others take you out, you know. Andrew Robson secured pole position for the Scale Saloon A final. Very fast into turn one, and a collision causes a car to roll. Into the chicane with five cars battling it out. Jason Barley now chasing Andrew Robson as they go down the hill and into the chicane. Flat out down the straight, and Barley pushing Robson really hard. Robson gets it wrong clips the curb and rolls it. Barley now has race leader John Lee in his sights as they hit the chicane on the limit. There's not much in it now, less than one half a second between them. Lee gets it wrong and Barley goes into the lead. Jason Barley from CML wins the Scale Saloon A final. Here are the results.
When it comes to fun in action, it's difficult to be off-road racing. We went to the headquarters of 10th Technology to talk to Richard Weatherly about the Predator four-wheel drive car and to take a look at some of the top two-wheel drive cars on the market today. Well, when the car was first brought out, as you say, there were many radical features, the inboard suspension, um, the, the gear drive transmission, moulded tub chassis, all these things were new at the time. Um, they're not totally new, of course, they were taken from full-size motorsport, and the benefits we felt that applied in full-size motorsport would apply equally with the model. So um, th these, these features were analysed, and each of them we thought would give a, an advantage to a radio-controlled model car. Um, and with various testing, we proved to ourselves that we felt this was the right way to go. Uh, and the car was designed with these features in at the beginning. Um, one of the things we sort of since learnt, and we probably didn't give enough credence to in the early days, was that the, the car needed a great deal more strength than, than we realised. Um, we were new to the sport. Um, I only did it as a hobby. And uh, to actually see a full race with 10 cars in, they do have to stand some punishment. So really, the, the, the basic design of the car has stayed because the inbuilt advantages are there in the design right from the beginning. Um, but we've brought it along, we've improved the efficiency of the design, and most of all, with the new model, the XK5, we've made the car much stronger. Hi, my name's William Mitchum, and I run a Lotus XX. I believe the single most important reason why the car is um, as good as it is is the fact that it's so user-friendly towards the racers. It's very easy to dial a car into every track we race on, whether we're racing on grass in the UK or in dirt, as we would in California or America. Um, the car is very robust, which makes it a popular choice for the club racers. Um, they can give the car um, a hard time and it still doesn't break, which I think is important at the level of racing which we're trying to interest people in, the grassroots. Principally, my car is as standard, which you could buy from your local model shop. Um, the main difference is um, we spend a bit more time with the transmission of the car. Uh, we try and lighten the car by having an aluminium motor plate, and then we try to pick up some extra drive out of the corners by using the MIP drive shafts, which are slightly smoother and give the car more progressive, smoother acceleration in low traction conditions. But apart from that, the car's standard, apart from a few small um, additional tweaks, such as different springs and changing the shock oil and pistons to suit various track conditions. At the moment, I'm finding there's very little difference in driving the Predator XK5 and the Lotus XX. They're both cars that handle it in a similar way in the respect that they both... I set them both up to have a slight degree of oversteer, so in that respect, they both have a similar attitude in cornering that the car will progressively break away, which is the style of driving I like. But the main difference really is the fact that the four-wheel drive car has a slightly quicker acceleration out of the corners. But apart from that, there's very little difference, I believe. When I prepare for a big race, um, the week before, I like to have a relaxed week at home and I like to spend each day of the week getting a certain element of the car ready, whether it's the motors, the batteries, the car. Um, each night is dedicated to a certain part of the car. And I like to make sure two of the important things, I believe, is you must be awake at the race meeting, so to get to bed early, I think, is important, and not to go out and have too much to drink, I think, is also vital before a race meeting. But apart from that, it's just getting the car ready, so if the car's reliable and I feel confident my driving's good, I'm happy. My biggest piece of advice to anyone starting off-road racing would be not to run before you can walk. The saddest thing I see in model car racing is kids who go along um, to a race meeting. And nowadays, unlike before, you can go and spend money at a model shop and buy the performance, which we as sponsor drivers have. And as beginners, they can't handle the extra power and extra um, facilities that they can provide themselves by opening their checkbooks. And it's so, it's so sad to see drivers coming along after one or two years giving up because they're being pushed either by their fathers or um, they're being frustrated by a lack of results purely because they haven't given themselves the time to race. I think that I've been racing for 11 years now and I feel that's it's taken me six or seven years to get very good at model car racing and it's something that you have to persist at rather than expect to happen overnight. Hello there, my name's Richmond Rogers. I race an associated RC10 B2. Uh, the reason why I like racing the car so much is very easy to drive, very light and nimble, quick down the corners, very strong, and very easy to work on. Um, 